Greetings sailors and welcome to Patreon Supporter Spotlight number 54, or rather the first part of it because I'm actually going to do a two-part bumper edition this week and uh, that's because I'm not doing normal YouTube stuff, I'm taking the week off from that more or less apart from this. And um, well, the reason why is because, you know, it's Christmas. Well, Christmas has just gone rather, but you know, it's the week after Christmas and I figured why not, let's have more or less a week off. The idea was that I'd still keep streaming, but that's not really worked out so far. Monday I just felt completely dreadful and then today, being uh, Wednesday as I'm recording this, my internet's been all over the place, it's been going, uh, the speeds have been going up and down like a yo-yo and the only way to stream without constantly dropping would have been to stream at 480p again. You know, the, the speeds have been getting down to, to being that bad in terms of the upload. So, uh, yeah, that that plan kind of fell by the wayside then. So hopefully it's uh, behaving itself a bit better tomorrow. But, you know, we can still do the video stuff. So here we are. It's just the uploads might take a bit longer. So this is Andy CX in the Straws. And the thing to know about this is it's his second game in the Straws and it's completely stock, which isn't the most comfortable experience. Now, the Straws itself just isn't a particularly comfortable ship, even when it's fully upgraded, but when it's stock, it's got a fairly horrible, uh, it's like 12 and a half second rudder shift, which drops by about four seconds. So even fully upgraded, I mean, you know, you've got a 900 meter turning radius either way, but you couple that with a 12 and a half second rudder shift, uh, that's not so fun. And of course, without the range upgrade, he is relying on the spotter plane to get any kind of decent range out of these guns. It's what, 15.2 stock? And that goes up to nearly 17. I think it's just shy of 17 when you're fully upgraded. So uh, when you're fully upgraded, I mean, what you do is you just try and fight at the medium to long ranges. You make use of those very good shell velocities and the, the good rate of fire and you just fire a lot of HE at things and then when you can get uh, close up to especially enemy cruisers at that point you can fire a lot of AP and they're both pretty damn effective. So the guns are really nice but you know the actual handling of the ship as I've said not so much and it's not a particularly stealthy ship either. Now at tier 8 you get much the same thing you get a slightly better turning radius by like 10 meters or something um, but you get the ability to mount a, a concealment module and so uh, you can be a little bit stealthier and of course that's the first tier where you get radar to play with so uh, that also adds a new thing into the mix. So the straws is kind of like you know if you can get used to playing the straws and if you can um, adapt your playstyle to fit this ship because this is one of those ships that requires you to adapt to it rather than you being able to adapt it to you uh, then it sets you very well uh, up for the uh, Chapayev and then the Donskoy at tier 9 and the Moskva is a little bit different again after that but uh, you know, the, the the important thing on all these ships is don't show any broadsides. I mean, that goes true for most cruisers, but uh, yeah, these ones are um, very easily deletable if you play it wrong. So he's just been running around trying to hit things at those um, medium to longish ranges. He's, he's used one of his spotter planes already. Um, ouch, yep, there we go. That was a bit nasty. Uh, not a, a citadel, I don't think. Or it might have been. No, I don't think it was. That was, what, 8k damage? So that won't have been a Citadel from the Gneisenau's guns. But it was uh, two penetrations it would have been. Or some uh, higher number of uh, overpens. But either way, that was a, a pretty big chunk of health just lost. However, he's managed to get a fire going on that Gneisenau in return. So he might even get this kill, which would be nice. So there we go, there's the kill. The enemy Straws is uh, taking some pot shots at him as well and Andy's uh, doing his best to try and maneuver a bit here but you see how awkward this thing is. I mean, the, the upside to that, that you know, the, the reason why they have the, the large turning radius, these uh, Russian cruisers, is uh, because they are long fast ships, you do at least get a good turn of speed. So um, that can 
make it a bit harder for people to 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 hit you you need to give quite a bit more lead to these and uh, well the french cruisers are also when they're using their speed boost especially but yeah uh, y you can't underestimate the speed of the soviet cruisers they are actually pretty damn nippy in that regard so they're not doing too badly so far they've knocked out three enemy ships to two but the enemy team does have one more cap circle and so although they are keeping pace on points just because they've got that extra kill so far um the enemy team is you know just constantly on the, the the edge of pulling forwards so they can't let that go on for too long they do need to to try and at least take back control now that Whiskavita there by the way uh, that that name caught my eye not because it's a player i've seen before or anything it's just a very very scottish name norman mcleod so you know i'm, I'm going to guess this is somebody that is uh, a fellow Scot, because I'm, I'm, I'm Scottish, you guys, I'm Scottish, I'm 100% genuine, bona fide Scottish, yes, anyway, but yeah, that's just a very, very familiar name uh, in my neck of the woods, although it's normally, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure about the regional variations, because um, I've always associated Muck MC with, like, Irish surnames more than Scottish surnames, but I think some Scottish surnames do use that form. But up my neck of the woods, it's all M A C, and it's very, very unusual to see Muck as opposed to Mac, although you basically pronounce it the same way. So that Jaws is uh, less than nine kilometers now. This is absolutely the range where you want to be switching to the AP, especially as he's broadside. Well, because he's broadside essentially, and Andy is doing exactly that. And, uh, well, you don't really want to do that ever, give your broadside to a fast-firing six-inch uh, six gunned cruiser. Uh, because it's not going to go well, as this enemy Jaws is finding out. And there we go, and he gets the kill. So, back to the HE, because the next thing is going to be a uh, destroyer. He's been quite circumspect so far. In, and he's also been quite... Um, um, you know, opportunistic, because you have to be, really, with, with the Soviet cruisers. Just higher tier cruisers generally. Um, you can rarely afford to be aggressive unless it's towards the end of a game and maybe you want that final bit of damage or you need to make a risky ploy because it'll be the only thing that saves the match. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, you want to try and keep the hit points as much as you can, use island cover as much as you can, and just uh, avoid taking the damage where possible. That might not be quite possible uh, in the next little while, however, because those planes are getting a bit close and the stock Straws AA is not very good. It's downright terrible, in fact. Fully upgraded, it's still not very good. I think it's one of the weaker cruisers for this tier in terms of uh, its AA power. And him having Hydro instead of Defensive uh, is also not good because he's not going to get the benefit of drops being scattered and given the horrible handling of this in the water oh, yeah he got a little bit lucky there that he didn't take a torpedo on the nose he did still take some bomb damage but it wasn't too bad all things considered he's also being uh, been given some cover by the allied carrier so he's got that going for him as well because if it was just his own AA power he was having to rely on and, uh, you know, if, if the enemy carrier had dropped those torps a bit better, because that, that wasn't a scattered drop at all, the, uh, the allied carrier wasn't able to get his uh, planes there in time, then, uh, yeah, that could have been a lot nastier. So there's the enemy ranger actually spotted by the planes. And for some reason here, he uh, switches to the AP shells. I'd have kept hammering with HE just at this angle all the while, these plunging hits, because the, the ranger, when I mean, he gets one fire, the ranger immediately puts it out, but he's sticking with the AP, and so this is where having the HE and just continually pelting this ranger would have been better. He's going to get some hits, but, you know, that salvo all ricocheted, so, um, okay. And there we go, one pen, one ricochet, it's just blind shooting here, more ricochets. So yeah, HE would have not done this, and he would have had the, the, the chance of setting fires. If you've got a broadside carrier to shoot at, then by all means uh, choose the AP, but I'm not sure why Andy was using it there. It was not the correct uh, ammo choice for this specific scenario. So because he's been firing AP and not you know, setting the flight deck on fire again, and there we go, it's finally back to the HE. The uh, the Rangers, um, you know, he's had time to cycle his planes, so Andy's actually going to have to dodge some more planes now. 
and well, the reason I know this is because I've seen the replay already, but yeah, uh, if he'd just not given the Ranger the chance, it would have made things a little bit more comfortable, but he at least, uh, you know, he's, 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 he's at a stage with this game where even if he dies, uh, it, it's not going to matter too much because they are basically winning. And this is one of those odd games where you watch somebody's replay and you think, eh, it doesn't feel like they've, they've maybe done that much. And, you know, a big chunk of his damage is against this Ranger at the end. But when you see his score screen, it is actually going to be reasonably impressive considering it's completely stopped. So there we go. He's got the guy burning. Uh, the Ranger once again makes a bit of a duff drop. And uh, although the... The stock advice is always turn into a torp drop. Well, it depends on the exact angle someone's making a torp drop at. And in that particular instance, turning away was exactly the right thing to do because he was already basically turning that way. And uh, given how the ranger made that drop, yeah, that, that was uh, the right call there. So that's four kills and a witherer from having... Uh, or is it arsonist? No, that's an arsonist, I think. I missed the, uh, the notification. Uh, yeah, no, that is an arsonist. Wither has got the kind of um, the the floody, you know, kind of bit of art in alongside the fire, hasn't it? That was very descriptive. So there's one enemy ship left and uh, exactly one chance at getting a kraken. Um, there's also an Edinburgh, however, firing at this Farragut. So you know, he only needs to catch the Farragut with one shell, but so does the Edinburgh. So does the Geniza now. And uh, if their uh, allied carrier uh, gets lucky with one of these bomb drops, then, you know, that's going to be the chance lost. But as it is, boom, there we go. There's the Kraken. 98k damage, 9000 XP, and uh, not bad, considering it's his second game. It took me a while to get used to the straws, and it might have been a bit of a... You know, we had some luck there having having the carrier to chew on. The carrier was basically stationary until Andy showed up. But even so, 2400 base XP in a completely stock ship. That's not half bad. That's not half bad at all. So we can see the damage done, and yeah, the greatest chunk of it was against the Ranger. But I mean, he also got some... Uh, uh, capping flags and assistance flags there as well but it, it does show you the power of these uh these guns you know of of that uh damage about a third of it was uh overall about a third was from fires in fact just over a third so uh or was it just over a third i don't know i can't do numbers don't come to me if you want numbers um <laughs> anyway yeah fires setting fires is the name of the game and uh that that illustrated why it's so powerful so next we have Tugboat 1984 in the Missouri. And this is a good time to do a Missouri game because Wargaming announced with the, the patch notes for uh, 915, uh, or not 915, this isn't World of Tanks. Nine, well, that wouldn't even be current for World of Tanks. 915 was a while ago, good grief. Um, 615, there we go. Got there in the end. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, once the Musashi is introduced in about two months' time, which is, you know, the rough time frame they've given, this is going to be taken off the tech tree. And uh, they had said it was going to be, you know, available indefinitely. So it feels a wee bit, you know, to turn around and say, well, actually, we're going to take it away. But they haven't said they're going to take it away forever, just that they're, they're only going to uh, have... The Masashi on sale, uh, or you know, or the one tier nine free XP ship on sale uh, at any one time, essentially. So it might be that they end up cycling them, that they end up rotating which one is on sale. And um, obviously, you know, the short term hope of wargaming is, I'm sure, that people will spend oodles of doubloons and oodles of actual money on converting free XP in order to beat the deadline. But to be fair to them, they've at least given a decent amount of warning. Now, as I had the free XP already saved up, that's basically what I've done. I just went ahead and bought it because there was no point holding off uh, it, at, at that stage. But uh, it does mean that once the Musashi is released, there's probably little chance I'll have the free XP required to immediately get that as well, which is kind of what I was doing. I was holding off on the Missouri precisely to get the Musashi. So then I could go and play it a bunch and, you know, put up videos on YouTube. But if the Missouri is then not going to be available, well, okay, I might as well get that. 
because it is absolutely, hands down, without a doubt, the best premium ship in the game for making money. This is one of the reasons why I'm sure they only want to have one of them on sale at a time, essentially. So, this is um, Tears of the Cruisers, and fortunately for Tugboat, he's not in a cruiser. He has done an unusual thing, though. He's actually pushed out wide on the flank. You know, I showed you basically right from the start of the, the game, albeit... Uh, sped up a bit and he's he's had a monster first salvo against that poor unsuspecting Alabama because they didn't know he was here up until the moment where he actually opened fire um, but it's it's kind of worked out for him because the enemy team for the most part isn't really able to take advantage of his isolation the carrier is having a go but this is a Missouri that hasn't had any of its AA knocked out yet although having said that tugboat didn't really even try and dodge these torpedoes which was maybe a miscalculation that's possibly damage he did not need to take but yeah he's basically i you know my thinking is he, he's taken advantage of the fact that he spawned um to the extreme southern end of his team in terms of the spawns if he'd spawned in the middle or if he'd spawned in the in the north if he'd wasted time coming all the way down here um, at that point it would have absolutely been wasted time it would have been the wrong move but I think it was just the fact that he spawned down at this end and uh, decided to give it a go decided to try his luck because there aren't that many enemy destroyers and the fact that it's an epicenter game means that the destroyers are more likely at least at the start to be in the middle and so that gives him relatively free reign to position and maneuver but despite that grand opening salvo um, he's now in a position of not having a lot to shoot at there's this poor wounded Alabama which he's going to get to shoot one more time but it's not going to be enough to finish him unless he gets really lucky and as it is no one pen and three over pens the rest of his team meanwhile is basically huddled behind the islands as tends to happen in epicenter on tears of the desert but uh, the enemy team they've largely they're basically pushing the north they've largely gone round that way and so that leaves tugboat free to just advance for the time being his only real worry is the uh, carrier but not so much because it's you know it's a bottom tier carrier and he's in a missouri and also that one of these destroyers might go for him and considering he's in a missouri um, he does make one major um, goof in this particular game in that I don't think he uses radar once if memory is serving me correctly which I think it is and there are certainly times when he could have when it would have served him or even it would have served his team to have used a radar but um, for whatever reason you know he, he just did not and uh, he had that oversight. The other thing I actually want to mention, that I've not really seen this before, but I think he's got kind of, he's, he's definitely got um, uh, AFT, and uh, I think he's probably got Concealment Expert, and I would imagine Concealment System as well. But he's also got, um, I think, the secondary module rather than the AA module on his ship, because his secondary range is 7.2 kilometers. So he's got kind of a, a semi-secondary spec. I don't imagine he's also got manual secondaries. Uh, but, um, yeah, e even with that, you know, even having not particularly spec into uh, 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 aircraft, anti-aircraft uh, skills, he's still really doing a number on these planes. Look at this. The the, the friendly uh, Saipan just locked those planes overhead and 25 plane kills already. But the Hiryu is still trying because... Um, I don't know, he's the immediate threat, I guess. The Saipan has also spotted the value of his AA being here, so he's actually stationed one of his fighter groups overhead. So, at last, more things to shoot at, but um, this is... Okay, I think this is a part where, again, he's maybe making a bit of a mistake in his eagerness to get towards the enemy. There's a bunch of broad, uh, broadside uh, battleships there. Uh, and this is also, by the way, one of those times, uh, well, also, this is, this is, I think, the first, even, of, of those times where he could profitably have used one of those radars just to see if there was a destroyer within range. Because, you know, it would ca uh, cover about half of the, uh, the middle cap circle there. So, anyway, that, that was a bit of a mistake. But, yeah, um, in, in coming this way, I, I personally might have swung out a bit wider. 
And I think he's come this way because he wants the broadside shots, but it, it limits his opportunity to manoeuvre. So either he's going to get stuck and be kind of in an immobile position, just bow tanking, at which point you do become vulnerable to torpedoes. You know, theoretically also vulnerable to aircraft attack, but not so much in this case as we're seeing, especially not with the Saipan fighters also helping. Um, but yeah, his positioning... Um, you know, this this is going to turn out to be a thing uh, that he's going to regret doing, potentially. Because it, it, it just completely limits his uh, opportunity to manoeuvre. Now, the smoke going up there, we know that Luoyang is within radar range, or was last spotted within radar range. It would be really nice, by the way, if you could see smoke clouds, you know, that like the outlines on the minimap. Even just to, uh, to give you a vague idea, it would be very, very useful. But that's uh, definitely a complete aside. But um, yeah, he's now attracting the attention. You know, they've finally realized that, oh, hey, wait, there's this thing on the flank that's shooting us. Now, you would think his team would be able to, you know, use this to their advantage. But his own team has completely started to scatter. They were all bunched up behind those southern islands. But he's now got two cruisers coming up behind him. A Tirpitz that's rather further back. And then to the south, there's three battleships who are just falling back and presumably f um, firing at uh, what to them would be highly angled battleships. So it's all a bit, you know, it's not ideal. So here's a wave of torpedoes. One of those destroyers taking advantage of the fact that he is um, not exactly moving around much right now. So... That was more damage that he couldn't really afford to take, and damage he didn't need to take because he still has three radars. He's not used any radars. This was his big mistake in this particular game. That that could have saved him a lot of grief, potentially, and it certainly would have helped out his team. So because he's uh, burned the damage control, he's now just going to have to burn from fire, and uh, although he's still got plenty of things to shoot at... Um, this is, this is where being in an isolated ship starts to be a bad thing because um, if you're the isolated thing that the enemy team can shoot at, they're all going to shoot at you. And now that wasn't the case to begin with. There was, um, you know, uh, an advantage to going on that flank and to, to coming round and uh, being sneaky and uh, catching things unawares. But uh, now he's in a position where... Far more enemy ships can actually shoot at him, and it's um, not paying off at all, because he can't really get out of this situation. He can try and back up behind an island, but he's going to take a heck of a lot of damage in the process. So there we go, his secondary is opening up at uh, just over 7 kilometers range. Uh, this is why I think he must not have manual secondaries, because your, your secondaries do not fire on both sides like that. Um, the only way your secondaries fire with the, the manual skill is if you've actually selected one of those ships. So yeah, it's a, I'm not sure about this build, but then I don't know what captain he's got on this. Maybe wh whichever captain it is, you know, it makes sense for it to have uh, um, secondaries. But I don't, I don't know if it's um, well, not it wouldn't be the captain. Though. I've already uh, surmised that, haven't I? Well done, Brain. Now of course it's the the secondary module that he must have, but. AFT, you know, that's just a useful skill on a US battleship, or any battleship, really. So he's in serious trouble now. He's burning his second to last heal. Um, that Kutuzov, he might be able to kill. He's relatively poorly angled, although a little bit much lead, but it doesn't matter. He gets the kill. Dodges another wave of torps. Gets a double fire, but is able to extinguish it, because he really needs to, unless he wants to die. But now this, uh, this enemy Missouri is uh, seriously trying to stick the boot in. However, at least, you know, temporarily, um, this has given Tugboat a very nice broadside ship to fire at because this enemy Missouri has somehow managed to not notice that island. And suddenly he's distracted by the fact that there's a Neptune in his face as well. So he's kind of getting away with it because this Neptune is uh, pressing forwards and trying to take advantage of uh, Tugboat providing a distraction. To the south, his team's basically been rolled over, um, they're, they're basically all died, the North Carolina is now isolated alone and, and is, you know, being focused by multiple enemy ships, so he's not going to last very much longer. And so, uh, although the enemy team has taken a heavy battering in getting to this point, um, they've had the mid-cap circle 
you know, for a while now. And they are quite equal on points, but unless they can get that cap circle back, it's going to be maybe a bit costly. And Tugboat himself, having taken so much damage after getting into this position, um, and I feel somewhat unnecessary damage, especially that torpedo hit when he could have used radar, um, he's not going to last too much longer. He's got one heal left. He can't take too much more sustained fire after this. Now the Saipan, who I think is one of the better players uh, on his team overall. Um, that's his second kill there. Takes out that low yank. And that's not that easy to do, taking out an American destroyer with a torp drop. Because the American destroyers are generally very maneuverable. So... Yeah, uh, that that was a good kill. That was a very useful kill, but it's uh, offset by the fact that they've just lost the North Carolina and the enemy three surviving battleships are all still somewhat healthy considering the stage of the game that we're at. He does still have these two cruisers here, but I mean, out in the open like this, um, yeah, he could potentially have uh, slammed on the brakes and tried to stay more towards you know a bit further back basically to, to remain unspotted but as it is this Megami comes around the corner and does spot him but he's uh, at least shooting reasonably well and um, judges the lead correctly however unfortunately RNG Jesus says no and it splashes all around the bow of the Megami and some volleys like that you know no matter how accurate the battleship yeah <laughs> the RNG just is frustratingly uh, not very nice. Now the Megami obviously panicking a bit because you know a low health Missouri is still a Missouri and those are still battleship guns and uh, tries to back away but uh, not quickly enough. So with the North Carolina dealt with those three battleships can now turn their attention to him and if you'd guess he's, he's basically going to die at this point you'd be right. He might get an opportunity to, be, uh, to do a little bit more damage, however. In fact, if he gets really lucky, he might even kill that very broadside enemy Missouri. But RNG, sadly, is not going to be that kind. That final shot is at least, however, enough to get him a high caliber medal. So he'll get something out of it. Now, the only other surviving battleship at this point, the Turpits, um, you might think he's running away because he's very low health, but you'd be wrong. Now, the two cruisers, I can understand them being circumspect, but under the circumstances, this Tirpitz could have been doing an awful lot more. This is one of those times when it's maybe unfairly focusing on a, a single player, but, you know, if you're the right player in the right place at the right time and you do absolutely the wrong thing, as this Tirpitz is doing, then you've got to accept some share of the blame for uh, a, a negative outcome because, well, unfortunately, these two cruisers, and I'm slightly spoiling it here, but these two cruisers are going to kind of screw up. And partly it's it's not their fault, partly it's just the fact that they're in cruisers facing battleships and we've come down to a situation where they are having to face down battleships, but also they're not really being very smart about it. I'm going to assume the Neptune doesn't have any smoke, but he basically comes out broadside and bam, gets annihilated, which just leaves the Otago, who still at half health himself, again makes a torp drop, actually does turn away, but then starts to turn back a bit and... Bam! Also gets annihilated. And I can't remember offhand if any of those torps actually find their mark or not, but, you know, the De Grossa spotted them well in advance, so uh, the Bismarck's got ample opportunity to try and dodge. Now, unfortunately, you know, the Saipan was doing their best to bring it back, but they just ran out of time. So that was one of those ones where, I mean, 176k damage is good, but... We can say Tugboat made some mistakes, but he was still the best performing person on his team. The the Turpits absolutely could have done more. I, I think the Saipan actually did do a decent amount, but some of the other players on the team really didn't seem to be doing that much at all. So, um, yeah, it, it was a bit of a disappointing game considering the, uh, the damage that Tugboat was able to do. But, of course, being the Missouri... He made an absolutely ludicrous amount of credits, regardless of the fact that it was a loss. 1.2, nearly 1.3 million credits. He actually did send me another game where 
Um, it was a 1.7 million credit outcome, but it was a bit of a, li- a, a less interesting game overall, although it, it was a win. So, you know, you stack those flags and camos on the Missouri and... Uh, yeah, it is absolutely worth it. You know, it is the best premium ship in the game for making money, by far and away. There's just no argument about it. And because it is more or less essentially an Iowa, um, it's also a fairly decent ship in its own right. As for the Masashi, we don't know yet. You know, it's still in development, it's still being tested. Um, people have as of me recording this, only just really got on the um, the preview versions to, to show off on streams and such like. So that's going to be getting tweaked for a while longer yet. But, you know, even if it's got worse shells than, than Yamato and worse AA, I mean, it's still going to be those monster 18.1-inch guns. And it's going to be able to see tier 7s with those guns. So, you know, the, the AA might be less good, but the overmatch still absolutely matters. So hopefully you've enjoyed this first bit of Patreon Supporter Spotlight 54. And if you have, you can leave any comments below. You can hit the like button. You can uh, sub to my channel if you haven't already. And as always, stay tuned for more.